today is the uh, unofficial Somerville Antique Roadshow. The uh, articles that are being brought on, some of them we have copies of, some are new to us. Um, the um, items have history behind them that the individual doesn't even, you know, know. They may have picked it up at a, um, a, a flea market and they really don't know the background on it. Some of them here, we have um, a bottle and it says Crane's, Pharma uh, Crane's Pharmacy. Now we don't know exactly where this uh, was located, but Somerville at one time had many, many pharmacies almost on two or three in every square. And um, I will look that up. We have city directories, but we have accepted this donation. I got it, any of this at yard sales? <laughs> Probably 20 more years ago. And these are two Somerville bottles for a pharmacist uh, named Crane. And I don't know if you can see what it says, but that fellow who's just here who said he was a bottle collector said 1860 to 1880, and that he had just gotten one of these bottles from the same guy recently. Yeah, but he didn't know where Crane's office would have been. And I showed these to Eleanor Batnelli, and she said that she, she, she told me some other pharmacists, but she didn't know where Crane would have been. This um, says Crane, it says, the label ripped off, it says Cambridge Port, it's a soapbox. And I don't know how old this is either. I'm, I'm gonna give it all to the museum, but I was curious, you know, to see what, if they had any dates or anything, that'd be kind of fun. Uh, with pharmacies thriving and Oh, yeah, all through the 30s and 40s. Now, on Highland Avenue, I was just saying to them, there were two very close to one another. One was on the corner of Cedar, and um, uh, Cedar and Highland Avenue. On the other side, not even six or seven houses up the street, Egan's Pharmacy. In Ball Square, we had um, a, a pharmacy where it gets stinky kittens that shop. That was a little pharmacy. And um, in Teal Square was Furbish and Shoe. What happens is that when they come in, there's a tin, a white tin, a five-gallon white tin. They found it at a flea market, but they didn't know the history behind it. You know, jumpy squires, not packing, they became kind of swift meat packing. And uh, that can was, the run, it was uh, one of the manufacturers here in the city that rendered the fat. And the um, meat packing companies started to come in summer. Well, John P. Squires was 1852. And um, it, it, what brought the industry to some of them were the trains. And they came, started to come through in 1835. Is there a, a favorite uh, object of yours or a favorite set of objects of yours? Well, one of the favorite uh, items uh, was Dr. Gus, who is a, was uh, a professor at Tufts, and he's on our board. He brought in an old toaster that has been reincarnated. It, they added all kinds of parts to it and it looks like something on wheels is going to take off. <laughs> but I remember that toaster. This, I believe, is my great-grandfather Casimir Tag, and um, he was from New York. And I'm trying to find out the vintage of this item so that I can ensure that it would have been the same age as Casimir Tag. But I think it's also a very cool item. Objects, models that are made in brass because they're permanent, sure. like that. And so a scientific instrument that you wanted to make sure did not you know, deteriorate, you would do in brass. Um, 
So, and a lot of times they're plated with gold on top of that, so it's hard to say exactly. Um, very often, if they are plated, people have polished them so much that the plating is gone. So usually then, where you would see the plating, are, it would look like little areas like that, which are not used so much. Right. You know, like little areas that are protected, that's where you would look to see, okay, this is the original you know, finish. So, it might have just been a highly polished brass. But these, if you can uh, get a conservator to polish them for you and lacquer them, okay. uh, and then, or you can just, you know, have it polished and then keep it in a very dry location. They were sort of the precursors to the Impressionist oh, painting. Oh, fantastic! I know, isn't it? Oh, painting! Leon Luce. <laughs> This type of cracking, that usually results says, from technique. Uh, that they paint, uh, the put down a layer of paint, and then if it doesn't fully dry, we put another layer on top. Just depending on their layering system. As it dries, it, it forms these sort of apertures that are sort of, you know, we call it alligator -like, You know, it's a common term. This is my grandmother's, but my mother used this in an astrological. <laughs> Okay, so this has a slight iridescence to it here, which is, means to me that uh, your plating here, uh, the silver plate, um, because it looks to me, hmm, I'm not sure, it could be completely silver, although I don't Usually it would be marked in some way. Normally I would think if anything it was going to be copper underneath. Mm -hmm. um, but you would then get green copper corrosion showing through and I don't see any of that. And what I am seeing is, you can see it's a little bit black and then you're seeing this uh, almost, all the time. A, almost yeah. this halo. Mm -hmm. And that is a very, very thin layer of tarnish. And that would be that would be normal yeah. Yeah. silver. That you're getting, it's just building up. It hasn't gotten to the total black state yet. So the um, an object like this, it's not coated. Ideally, is always handled in gloves because oh. your fingerprints will actually corrode it. Um, I did not know that. So I so do. <laughs> I think I do see a fingerprint there. Oh, probably. But uh, my dad. So the question is also, I do see a little bit of a coppery color there. Mm -hmm. So that makes me wonder, you know, like was this, is this possibly copper with a silver plate? And the silver plate is actually pretty thick, so I can't really tell. This here is a glass that was gifted to my great aunt by her brother who worked at Union Glass. So I, I figure this is from Union Glass and I have a cane that matches it. But they're unsure about, he didn't know, he said he wasn't qualified to say whether it was or not. So, but it's a great piece. Here, they frayed them out onto the yes. right, and so and so when they line it, when you do this with a modern one, this is probably doesn't going to have this is Japanese paper, but it does have this what's called crash or mole, 
which was used a lot in, in these in these oh, larger so this, production this. bikes. Yep, the, the stuff that looks like cheesecloth. You can yes. see it. Oh, you can see it. Thing? See it through the oh paper. Gosh, yes. Yep. So it's just a, it's just adding a little bit of support along the hinge. It's not the strongest material, but that's what they used a lot in the higher. Yeah. Completely lasted a while. Yeah. So, but that said, um, these were also the text block was made separate from the case. Once we start getting to the 1800s, and so the case is made separately like this, and so. Instead of you know like 300 years before that, where the the lacing was laced into the boards, these are made separately. So the case is made separately. Your glue goes here, and you literally are just right. And so the only the only place where this is attached to the case is is with the glue. And so all the stress is here. And so that's why it's it's always going to break here first. But it's still hanging on, you know. In really good shape. Yeah, I, when I got it, I just put it on the bookshelf. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And I also wanted to bring it to find out how I should keep it because well, I don't want to ruin so it. So, you, well, another thing you could um, do, and, a, and you know, a conservator, a bookbinder who does conservation repair could do this for you. They could, they could mend the hinge a little bit, sort of reinforce that and give it because it doesn't need anything heavy handed. You don't want to, you know. But you could put it in a box, and that would definitely um, protect it. There's a couple different kinds of boxes. This is what's called a CMI box. But these you order, you send them the measurements, you know, and have it, and it'll fit your. That's right. And so there's like that, and there's also. Um, Four flat um, is a similar thing, but that's even simpler. And then probably the basic. It's just something this simple. Yeah. It's a very simple four flat, yeah. but it's just to keep it protected and keep you know. Well, I keep it protected it on a shelf and. I, yeah. I did have yep. Fun. Yeah, and that's where they're always going to collect us the most is yeah. up here. Yep. Yeah. And um, but it looks great. I mean, the, it's a little bit worn at the head caps, but. Um, so is there a lot known about the so when they started? I mean, 